with the federal government for over 10 years documenting the inequality and developing evidence-based solutions and quantifying it. I need to tell you that although I'm critical of the government, I don't criticize them unless we've been part of the solution. It's not enough just to point out a problem. You've got to be there to do something for kids at works. We did that for over 10 years. The federal government agreed with both of those. We have letters on file from the minister, etc. Thank you for the great work. But they walked away from it. And the problem with that, of waiting for the federal government to do the right thing, is if you track it right back to residential schools, there's never been a time in the history of this country when they've treated First Nations kids fairly. So how long are you going to wait? Kids only have one childhood. So in 2007, we filed a human rights complaint against the federal government, alleging that their inequitable and flawed provision of child welfare and their failure to implement Jordan's principle was discriminatory under the Canadian Human Rights Act. The feds would spend three and a half million dollars and six years trying to get it derailed on legal technicalities. Their arguments are basically this. It's unfair to compare our level of funding, the federal funding, to what the provinces get. That's not fair to us as a federal government. Second argument is we don't directly deliver child welfare. The federal government provides funding to First Nations agencies who employ social workers. So if that social worker is delivering an inequitable level of service. It's the social worker who's responsible, not us as the federal government. It's the second argument. Third argument is this is not the proper forum for the case. We value the Canadian Human Rights Commission and they have tribunal, but this is not the proper forum. They don't name what the proper forum is. And clearly it wasn't negotiation and working together because we had tried that for a decade. Those are the three arguments. Fortunately, we went all the way to the Federal Court of Appeal, which is one level below the Supreme Court, but they all ruled against Canada and forced the hearing on the merits. So for the first time in the world ever, on February 25th, 2013, a government went on trial for its contemporary treatment of children. Not as a way of blaming, although we're going to get a finding whether they discriminated or not. This is not about let's say sorry and feel bad about things. It's about let's do right by the kids for the future generations. Right? Let's fix this problem. If it has to be by court order, to let it come. Now when we filed that case, I'll never ever forget. It was just about eight years ago now. And I was walking out of Parliament. We just had a news conference. The National Chief and Phil Fontaine was there. And I could hear the sound of my footsteps on the concrete. Why? Because there was nobody there. This was, in my view, one of the most important human rights cases of our kind. Not just for First Nations people, but this puts a red-hot poker stick into the conscience of every moral human being in the country. And nobody was there. Now, I couldn't believe that people didn't care, or they think we deserve it, but I actually don't believe that. I, like many other people, believe in the goodness of caring Canadians. We felt if we provided them with the information, not asking them to draw an opinion or take a side, but simply peel back the layers so people could see what we see and then make up their own minds about the case, people would start coming. And that's why we created the I Am A Witness campaign. So if you go onto this website, you're going to see all the Government of Canada's court documents, all of our court documents. We don't ask you to take a side, we just simply ask you to watch. And thanks to Aboriginal People's Television taking the federal government to court, they were able to film all the hearings. So you can watch all the hearings firsthand. Now, you can see there we've gone up from zero to 13,000. It's the most watched human rights case in Canadian history. It may be the most watched human rights case in North America. So how did we get there? Was it because a lot of adults decided to rally around? Not exactly. The first people who started showing up at the hearings were about that old. See, they uh, started with a group of teenagers who came to the hearings. 
And uh, one of the young men came up and he said, we're from alternative school, <laughs> which means we get into trouble a lot. I said, good, because so do I. I said, I just try to get into trouble for doing the right things more often, at least at my age. And he said, sometimes we deserve it. But sometimes it's these stupid systems that deserve it, and nobody ever takes them on. But you are, and that's why we're here. And you want our help, so that's why we're going to stay. They stayed for the first two days of the hearing. And then they came back several weeks later, but they were wearing new apparel. They had designed I Am A Witness t-shirts, and they brought the rest of their high school colleagues with them, and their younger brothers and sisters. Meanwhile, we have this great heroine, Shannon Kustachin, a First Nations girl advocating for proper schools because these inequalities echo across other areas of experience, where she was asking kids to write letters. So by 2012, we had so many children attending the hearings that we had to move the hearings to the Supreme Court of Canada and have the kids booked in in shifts. So this is us in 2012. And I remember the security guard at the Supreme Court of Canada, he said, it's like a daycare in here today. <laughs> and then at the end of the day, he said, you know what? These kids are better behaved than most of the people who come here. <laughs> and uh, so imagine yourself. You're seeing this play out in a courtroom. You have the government of Canada making those legal and technical arguments. And you have us arguing to want to bring forward these facts and talk about what's good for kids. How would it make you feel to see that audience? So what do you think the kids thought about this, sitting in that audience? There's a little guy during the coffee break, and he uh, comes out, and I was heading over to the ladies' room. And he says, first of all, there's something really important you need to know. There's marble in there. <laughs> he said, this is a fancy place. <laughs> I said, OK, and there was. And he said, this is the best place to sit because we're getting all the autographs of the lawyers. And they know who the lawyers are because they're wearing those long black capes. <laughs> they have autograph books and they're getting everybody, right, including the government of Canada. So I said, well, how has it been going? What have you been watching? He said, well, you know, I remember when you came to our school and you told us that being a witness is like being a newspaper reporter. That you don't just believe something because someone tells you that you got to go listen to all sides of the story, and then you talk to your mom and dad, or you talk to your teacher, and you decide what you feel about it. So he said, I'd already heard you, so I came for the government side. Hear what the government had to say. And I said, so what did you learn? So he whips out this full scap piece of paper, line drawn down the middle, with all these tallies on one side, one, two, three, four, five, big long list. And uh, on the other side, there was a shorter list. And I said, well, what is it? He said, the long list is when the judge asked the Canada people a question. And the short list is when they answered. <laughs> I think she, he should try that in question period. <laughs> so the kids saw the evidence. And uh, I'm going to take you through some of that right now. This actually was on Indian Affairs website in 2007. I actually screenshot and printed it off at the time. If you would have been on there in 2007, you would have read this piece, Changes in Landscape. Provinces and territories have introduced new policy approaches to child welfare and a broader continuum of services and programs that First Nations Child and Family Service Agencies must deliver to retain their provincial mandates. However, current funding approach, federal funding approach to child and family services has not let First Nations Child and Family Service Agencies keep pace with provincial and territorial province, uh, policy changes. And therefore, the First Nations Child and Family Service Agencies are unable to deliver the full continuum of services offered by the provinces and the territories to other Canadians. This is their own website. Right? Now, the funding formula they use here in BC, there's three formulas they apply across the country. The one in BC provides the lowest level of funding. Kids in BC are the most disadvantaged. And just to give you a sense of how old this thing is, it was developed in 1989, which I think was Taylor Swift's birthday, right? Was that it, with her album? And if we think back to 1989, the World Wide Web was just being discovered in, in, in Europe, right? No internet. 
Now, there has been no increase in this formula for prevention services in 24 years. Is there anyone in this audience that's 24? You are? Can you stand up? So when she was a baby, they did the last, day, the last uh, increase in prevention. Thank you. Um, there's been no increase in inflation for 18 years. 18 years. And what does that mean? That just in inflation losses alone, we've lost 21 cents on the dollar. There's no increase in salaries for 18 years, right? So these social workers are being paid at these salaries from 18 years ago. And if the agencies want to keep qualified people, then they have to spend money that comes out of that limited prevention pool, right? And the amount of money that they give for legal is $5,000. That's supposed to take care of all your corporate legal, like your human resources legal, incorporating, as well as all your child and care related legal, all your costs for inquiries. So this is the formula that's currently applied here in British Columbia. And here's how much the federal government says that they're shortfalling now. So this is an internal federal government document being presented, I believe this one is going to, this is a director general, so that's going to the ADM, I think. Uh, assistant Deputy Minister in Ottawa. And you can see that this is a secret PowerPoint, but not so secret anymore. And uh, October 31st. And you can see that they think how much they're shortfalling in child welfare, right? So these are documents we're filing that they have written. And this builds on the findings of the Auditor General, who specifically looked at child and family services and found it to be flawed and inequitable in 2008. So what, the, what we see here, in some ways, is encouraging. We see honest federal public servants saying there's a problem. The speaking notes and the presentation notes don't necessarily go to this degree of accuracy. But at least there were people plugging on the inside trying to do the right thing. Here's a, um, how are they covering off the shortfall? Some, some of you would have seen the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs making announcements for no money for schools. Does anyone remember that in the paper? We're making more money for schools. Well, what we found was this document, which showed that in order to cover off the shortfalls, because really, uh, CHOP offers a statutory program, right? They've got to pay for it. Uh, they're not paying enough, but they're going to pay something. And there's shortfalls in income assistance and education as well. So to cover those off, they're taking the money from schools, the building schools fund, and the building houses and building water fund, and transferring that over to cover the shortfalls to the tune of a half a billion dollars. Now, what the Winnipeg Free Press said about this is they said, you know, first of all, this really raises questions about the authenticity of government funding announcements. But it also, they're always, the government of Canada is always after First Nations leadership for transferring money from one pool to another. And yet, behind the scenes, they're doing it to this order of magnitude, right? So you can see there, that's a significant amount of money. And you can see that... There's not enough money in that infrastructure thing in the first place, right? It's not as if there's a huge surplus there and we're just taking money over. Now, if you're the government lawyers and you've seen all these documents go in and your witnesses have talked to them, what are you going to say in your final written submissions in your defense? This is actually from the federal government's final written submission. You can read the entire document online. You can actually watch the closing arguments entirely online. I hope that you do. And you can see there... That we, the complainants, that would be ourselves and the AFN, rely on an assortment of internal government documents, which we assert are admissible for the truth of their content. Imagine this. We're actually saying that the government con documents must be truthful, right? As either public documents or admissions against interests. The federal government says they're not admissions. These are personal views of their employees. Regarding the Auditor General's report, they say they should be given very little weight because we did not call the Auditor General to testify. But the Auditor General's Act forbids the Auditor General from testifying in any legal proceeding in the country. And it doesn't note that the federal government in the Auditor General's reports say they agree with all the recommendations. I think the biggest indicator of how weak the government of Canada's case is is when you look at expert witnesses. We called expert witnesses on our side. And the federal government had the ability to call the same. 
and they uh, had KPMG, the accounting firm, lined up to do it. So they had KPMG, go, remember I told you we worked on those solutions and we costed them out? They uh, got KPMG to go through those numbers and produce a report. The problem for the federal government is that KPMG agreed with us. <laughs> Their calculations came within 0.12% of our calculations. So we actually filed the federal government's expert report as evidence on our side. <laughs> so thank you to the federal government for funding that. <laughs> we didn't have to do that. Um, needless to say, the federal government decided not to call KPMG as an expert witness. So they have no expert witnesses. So um, we are, through the evidentiary phase, it's taken us eight years. Uh, we are at the Caring Society. We uh, lost all of our federal government funding within 30 days of filing the complaint. So we're the, we've been all for the long, I think we're the only lo longest standing national Aboriginal organization that receives no money from the federal government. And we're proud of that. Um, we'd rather be small and stood up on principle, and I'm prepared to sacrifice the organization if necessary, because there are 163,000 childhoods that are much more important than any organization will ever be. So this is one of the teenagers who came back to the hearings. They, uh, a new one came, and this is what he wrote. He said, the Caring Society and AFN have this case in the bag, he says. And I wish that the new laws would be put in place protecting the rights of First Nations children. And it really shows to me how you can bring in people who don't know a lot about this stuff, but people know right from wrong. You don't need to be a judicial expert to understand what's right from wrong. And uh, one other thing about the Caring Society is every Valentine's Day, we host the biggest Valentine's Day party in Ottawa. And uh, what we do is uh, we invite all these kids to send Valentine's so First Nations kids can grow up safely in their families, get a good education, be healthy and proud of who they are. And you can, thanks to Amnesty, they've got hearts on the back so you can do it. And guess where all the Valentines go? To the Prime Minister. <laughs> and uh, the kids will show up on Parliament Hill and they will read their letters and their poems directly to the Prime Minister. So this is us out there that day. And uh, so you might want to know what some of the letters are, right? So uh, one, uh, one kid gets up there and says, you know, I'm in girls hockey. And um, kids do not know what a conservative is. They do not care what a liberal is, and they don't care what an NDP is. But they do know what a warm house is, what love is, what good food is. And if you really cared about kids in this house, you would do what my hockey coach says. He says, when you, he says, you have to play for the team on the front of the sweater, not the team on the back of the sweater. And all of the Canada's kids live on the front of the sweater. And we need you to do the right thing. Another little guy steps up to the plate and he says, dear Prime Minister Harper, do you have a cat? I have a cat. His name is Micah and he's a boy and he's black. And of course, we know the Prime Minister has many cats because the wife is involved in a lot of the SPCA ventures. And then he gets right down to business. He says, Stephen Harper, listen to me. If you do not build more schools, you're going to create a crime wave and lose all of your money. Because kids who cannot get an education cannot get jobs. And they're still going to need money when they grow up. So there's, some of them are going to have to steal it. And then people in the community are going to get mad because crooks are invading their homes. So you better man up right now and fix this problem because you're in charge. You know, kids understand discrimination. And that's why they keep on coming back every Valentine's Day. And they're not there to make the government feel bad. They're there because they believe that adults can do better. They really do. Is equality really that hard, they ask. Is it really that hard? And uh, just to give you a little sneak preview and inspire some of your Valentine's Day writing, that's what a couple kids in Ottawa were doing yesterday, writing their Valentines. You know, I've always said, when I, when I 
uh, did the opening statement for the Caring Society at the tribunal, and I said this to the tribunal members, do not decide this case in favor of the Caring Society. I don't think the lawyers are very happy with that. And I said, and do not decide it on behalf of the government of Canada. Make the best decision for children, and we will all win. We will all win. You know, this case is about kids, and kids are showing us what reconciliation really is. It's not about standing silent. It's not about making excuses. It's about standing up when you're needed. And if we all manage to do that, just imagine if all of us in this room sent a Valentine's Day, and when the ruling came out, we tweeted that ruling. We wrote to our member of parliament. We told our neighbors about it. Don't you think it would be a wonderful thing that by Canada's 150th birthday that we finally turned the page on this long history of racial discrimination towards First Nations children and one towards a, a future where all of our children can feel proud of the history that we left them? And if we finally do that, maybe one day, maybe Charlene and I will be walking along the street in Ottawa and Shelby will see that house again and she'll say to us, can you see what they're doing there? And we'll say, yeah, they're laying sod. And she said, yes. They're making it look beautiful because what happens in that house is beautiful for children. That's the day we're all hoping for. Thank you all for coming. That was wonderful, Cindy.